Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Change the Shed. It is March 13, 2024. Happy that you are all here. Um, welcome, welcome. Looks like uh, y'all have been chatting already in the chat. That's great. Um, for those of you who haven't used YouTube a lot, in order to actually chat, YouTube makes you have a channel, which is uh, just an account. So if you'd like to participate in the chat ever on Change the Shed, just get, if you have a Gmail account or other Google um, accounts, it's really simple to add a YouTube account. So that way you can chat with all of us if you'd like to. Not required, of course. The next Change the Shed will be on March 27, which is two weeks from now. Hope to see you there. And the other thing I wanted to say at the top is that on March 30th, I'm running my popular short workshop, um, Fixing Your Sheds. So if you have trouble um, with shedding, uh, which we all do at some point uh, where you're weaving along and things just aren't working, this is a class that goes through step-by-step -step how to fix your sheds, um, depending on what situation you're in. So that class is open for registration. Um, and there's a live component on March 30th. Uh, which will be recorded, of course. And then two weeks after that, there's another live Q&A where we'll go over your homework and um, any questions you have. All of that is recorded. There's much more information in the class, like all my online classes. There's um, videos and handouts and all kinds of stuff. So it's not just about the online meeting, but that is a, a bonus for this uh, class. It's called Fixing Your Sheds. And um, I will put a link below this video um, so you can find it. Otherwise, just go to my website. Um, hello, Julia from Germany. And um, Jean is here from Texas. And Dave's here from the UK. Uh, it's snowing here, by the way. You all are mentioning whether it's sunny or cloudy or whatever, wherever you are. Um, I will say, I'm just getting a notice that my internet has sagged. I'm still working on the internet. Um, I am on a satellite internet now and occasionally I will blink out for five to 10 seconds. And if that happens, if I freeze, just wait, the satellites will catch up and I will come back. So um, it's not gonna drop. It's just that I think if you just wait, I will unfreeze unless it's on your end. But if it's on my end, I apologize. It may happen at least once during this um, broadcast. Uh, Mary Lou's here from Cape Cod, and Karen is playing with some Icelandic yarn that she found at uh, Webbs. Yeah, that's a cool place, uh, Karen. Yeah, it's in Massachusetts. Um, uh, Mary's here from Wisconsin, and Jam is here from Brittany, France. Awesome. Welcome. First time live. Uh, Victoria's here from Healdsburg, and Anne from Indianapolis. Uh, Gail's here from Pennsylvania. Ooh, I'm glad her guild started a tapestry special interest group. That's very cool. Um, Elaine, I'm with you. Elaine is also in Colorado. It is gloomy. It's snowing and foggy out there. So Colorado is gloomy today, but we do need more snow. So I hope we get some more. Um, Christine in Texas and Karen in Pennsylvania. Paula's here from Vermont. Uh, Jessica's here from Illinois. Barbara from Chico, California. Um, Vicki from Massachusetts. You guys have some sun out there. Nan's here from New York. Um, Amy in Boulder. We don't have very much snow, Amy. Uh, just like a dusting. But I'm hoping we might get some more. Um, I'm out in the southwest corner of the state, so I'm close to Four Corners. And Boulder is on almost the entire opposite side of Colorado, on the other side of the mountains. Um, I'm sort of on the Western slope and Amy's on the front range. I don't know if any of you care about that. <laughs> um, uh, great, so Dave's been working on pick and pick. Gosh, pick and pick's such a great technique. It um, can be tricky, but it is um, fantastic. Uh, Ginger's here from Pennsylvania. Welcome. Cheryl from Maryland. Oh my gosh, you guys. There's lots of you today. Devin Montana, Rose in Southwest England. Don's here from Wisconsin. Sally is also in Wisconsin. 
got good Wisconsin representation today. Um, uh, Southampton in the UK, working on a saffron loom. That's great. New to tapestry weaving. Welcome. Enjoy the tapestry. Uh, Marla's here. Um, yeah, it's chilly in the house. When the sun isn't out, it is chilly in the house. She was saying that as wearing a sweater. Um, okay, you guys are here from all over. Um, Patricia, uh, several of you from France. Wonderful. Lisa's here from Whidbey Island. What a beautiful place. Carol's here from Kentucky. Oh, Lisa has reminded me, make sure you go watch her beautiful um, video about her guanacos. She raises guanacos on Whidbey Island and um, a fiber life if you go to that website. Um, beautiful, beautiful animals and her podcast is awesome. So if you need a new podcast, A Fiber Life, just look it up. You'll really enjoy it. Um, Lisa did not tell me to say that. I just really love the podcast. It's fantastic. Um, and the third season is uh, rolling out. So I just heard the first uh, episode from the third season. Catherine's here from England. Um, Jessica's learning about a backstrap loom. That's cool. Emily from Albuquerque. Welcome, Emily. Um, I grew up in Gallup, so of course Albuquerque is a place I've been a lot. Uh, Jennifer's here from Joshua Tree. I always say, I love Joshua Tree. I just wrote a book about a woman um, in Joshua Tree called What I Learned from Falling. Great book. Um, probably Jennifer has heard of it. it. Takes place in Joshua Tree. Um, Judy, if you like hiking books and adventure and uh, thoughts about life and what we're doing on the planet, that's a good book. Um, Judy from Vancouver. Um, Karen's here from the UK. Um, awesome. Julie's here from Kirkland uh, working on dish towels. Hemming them, hem stitching forever, right, um, Julie? So, um, yes, the next Change the Shed is March 27. And I also want to not forget to thank all of you who've given donations for this um, program so that I can keep offering it. The technology is obviously not free, um, nor is my time. And so it is just, I really appreciate those of you who have thrown some donations at this, you can do that by going to my website and look under Change the Shed. And there is a button there also under Change the Shed on my website, um, which is under online learning. Uh, there is lists of all the episodes and links to all the stuff I talk about. So if I'm talking about something and you want to see, oh, where do I find that podcast Rebecca just mentioned, there's probably a link on my website. Um, I do spend some time putting those there, so if they're helpful, um, please use them. I don't take the time to also put them under the YouTube video. I guess that would be possible, but um, don't know why that hadn't occurred to me before. <laughs> Leslie's here from Vermont. Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy you're all here. Um, I am working on the same piece today. I hope you all are working on something that... Um, you are enjoying, whether it's tapestry or not. I'm working on this piece. Let me see. I actually also took a picture so that it's this piece. So you could see the whole thing. I want you to be able to see what I'm weaving, but that is the whole piece so far. And let's see, in the picture, the top of the piece is actually just out of the top of the picture. So I am just over halfway done with this little tapestry. And uh, yeah, definitely having fun weaving this. I think I may do a couple more of this um, sort of idea. Anyway, um, today may not be the most interesting weaving, but hopefully you'll get something out of it. I'm going to be filling in this area um, um, up to here. I will be changing colors in here, and then something else fun is going to happen up there, but um, we'll see if we get there or we'll have to wait um, until next time to see what, hap what happened. Uh, yes, so... 
Um, this is a fringeless four salvage warp you can see in the image down here. That's why the bottom looks different. I'm actually weaving it on my uh, one of my Merrick Big Sister looms, which is just a fancy pipe loom. And so it is. it works fine for fringeless. Fringeless is a technique of making four salvages where you have a shed the whole way. It's different than most four salvage. Um, it's different than the way the Navajo do four salvage. It's different from Mirex often demonstrates on the saffron loom, making the loom real short and then weaving, you know, the whole width of the loom. And this is different than that because I have this nice big shed that I can open for the whole time I'm weaving. Sarah Sweat and I did a class about that, which many of you have heard me talk about ad nauseum. Um, but if you're interested in this technique, Sarah teaches. Sarah teaches it and I'm her sidekick. Uh, Sarah is quite a master of so many things. I don't think a change the shed would go by without me mentioning Sarah. I'm not going to apologize for it. She's brilliant. Okay, so basically um, I am just filling in these low areas. So I did, as y'all know, in a lot of my weaving, I love doing these eccentric kinds of outlines for at least narrow areas. And now I need to fill it back in. So we're weaving perpendicular to the warp. And one of these sheds is open. You can see I can just get my hand in there easily because there's a bar at the top holding it open and the other shed I am picking. You can use the shedding device on a Mirex for a fringeless warp. It does work. You have to be a little bit careful because sometimes it can make the warps walk a little bit. But I could put it on at this point and they would be fine because I've woven so much. Oh, also, you probably hear my dogs. There's a lot of commotion around here today. Um, fixing a safety issue um, in the house, and there are uh, a couple amazing contractor people working on that, and uh, the dogs love to bark at them. Of course they do, right? Okay, so this is level here, and I'm gonna bring this over. This is a gentle curve, so I can bring this over and fill this in again, and um, I've had a lot of students in uh, some of the online classes with weft tension problems lately, which is not unusual. Weft tension is, you know, this is the weft tension. How much weft am I getting in there? Am I putting a bubble like this or am I bringing it straight across? That would be a very tight weft tension. If I wove like that all the time, the warps would sink, uh, suck in together. So getting the right amount of weft in there at any one time can be a challenge. It's something that every single tapestry weaver has to deal with all the time, it just, I promise, it becomes much more second nature with practice. So you have to just keep weaving. You have to understand how it works first. And I do talk about it in many, probably every online class at some point, I will be talking about web tension, even in the advanced ones, because it will continue coming up. I just put a little extra pass in there because that was that side was a little bit low. I wanted to um, build it up so that we are weaving um, evenly. Uh, and it looks like I am. Sometimes my comments scroll and sometimes they don't. It looks like today they're not. Um, I've lost my place. Okay.
Oh, Kathy asked. That's an interesting question, Kathy. So I was talking about fringe lists um, for salvage weaving. Um, Kathy says she just bought my book. So that my book is called The Art of Tapestry Weaving. And um, was wondering if Sarah and I had ever thought about doing a book on fringe lists. Um, the fringe list technique, which is really just a warping technique. Um, we have not... We have not talked about that, Kathy, but now that you mention it, I'm going to have to think about that. Sarah does have a lot of wonderful guides on her website um, that she hand draws and illust hand illustrates and uh, about a multitude of very useful tapestry things. Her website is a field guide to needlework.com. Uh, oh, thanks, Sally. She says she likes the color change. Um, yeah, this piece, as some of you remember, languished on the loom for two years. Um, I moved it here, and I had one more color of this brown that I wanted to go. Um, oh, sorry, you can't see that. Um, these colors are brown. I had one more color of brown that I wanted to go in here, and in the move... For whatever reason, I just have not yet been able to find that color. So I changed the design a little bit and decided to leave it out and just go with the gray. Actually, a few um, sometime last month, I was I did weave another color in there and I didn't like it. Took it out. Um, all right, so I'm. Bringing that all in level. Just gonna keep going here. I am considering shifting. So this is the um, Fru yarn uh, from, here I'll show you the tag. It's a Swedish yarn um, made by Borgs. Now it's going to be sold by Bakken's. Um, Clippin still makes it. Um, can you, hold on, there we go. So it's F-A-R. Oh, sorry, you can't see all the Swedish letters. There you go. It said something like "fua" or something like that. For you Swedish people, I apologize abjectly. Um, I apologize profusely. Uh, anyway, they make this dyed in the fleece, beautiful heathered yarn. So this is the darkest that I have of this. And I do have some hand dyed that I'm thinking um, I'm going to consider mixing in at the top of this. So that's, we'll see how that looks by, I probably won't go all the way to this solidly dyed immersion dyed yarn because it will look so much different than the heathered, but I may try mixing in a strand or maybe even two. Sorry, this is, this is how I would do this if I were not weaving on camera. So let's just do it that way. These tails are both pretty short. I was either gonna have to splice both of them or I'm just gonna splice them together, which will be one less step. And I can cut those tails off when I'm, when this is off the loom. If I were weaving from the back, I weave um, my big pieces from the back and I actually teach, um, warp and weft is taught at this point anyway, um, from the back, weaving from the back. And so those tails would be on the front and I would snip them off after I'd woven a little bit on top of them. Thanks, Vincent. Glad you're here. And 
The A has an O on top. Yes, it's pronounced like an O. So fo, like in forest. Foro? Foro? Is that closer? I feel like so many Americans, we don't really learn other languages anymore. And I, it, um, it's actually embarrassing to me that all my European friends speak more than one language. And um, so learning at least a few words in other languages seems important. So thank you, Vincent. I might be able to remember the word forest, so maybe I can at least get it a little bit closer. Um, when you Google how to say that word, um, um, ra, fora, fora. Hmm. Um, when you Google it, there's like six different pronunciations. It's like uh, when I was in Iceland doing that residency in 2022. Um, gosh, it's fun to listen to Icelandic. What a great um, country uh, and language, but um, there's a lot of TH sounds in uh, Icelandic. All kinds of letter combinations that you think would sound totally different if you're an English speaker. Um, in Icelandic, uh, they just have, yeah, they're just, I, this is true of any language. It's just, uh, a matter of listening, which a lot of us are not that good at listening. We can get better though. Okay. So this is the boring part of the weaving. Now that I've filled that in, What have I done here? Okay, so then, you know, sometimes you have to go back and figure out what you did. Like I stopped this pig here instead of taking it all the way over. So just like pull it up and look at what you were doing and realize, oh, this isn't finished. This is a shedding, a, often a shedding problem that you don't finish your sequence. And then when you come back to it, you know, you go and weave another part and then you come back and you're like, this is all wrong. Well, you just forgot to finish weaving that sequence. Another tip, which I'm going to share, which is about weft tension, but it's also just about practice. Um, it's easy to think that your salvages are straight, and um, when they are either drying in or getting wider, I'm just going to move this a little out of the way. Um, so it's easy to think they're straight and the only way in my experience, um, to really know is to measure. So you can't see this, um, ruler at the bottom, but let's see. So I, at the bottom, I was at six and a quarter and here I'm at six and a quarter and maybe a, there's a tiny bump right there, a tiny bit more. So I'm pretty much right on. Depending on what you're weaving, optically it can um, fool you. And the only way to really know, in my opinion, is to use a ruler, just to, is to measure it. You can use guide strings, but they also um, can fool you. If you tie your guide strings really well and you don't screw them up by accidentally weaving them in or something, um, some people are really successful with them, but uh, I, for the most part, don't use guide strings, which doesn't mean you can't. Oh, Vincent, thank you for the, um, 
compliment on the weaving and I hope you come back to weaving. He says he hasn't um, woven for a few months, so. I think there are seasons in how we make things also. I feel like I often have students email me and say, I'm so sorry I haven't been in the class, blah, blah, blah happened. And I appreciate those emails a lot. I really um, enjoy knowing what happened. Um, often the stories are, you know, full of stress and that kind of thing. And I, um, life happens and, uh, you know, this, we do this for joy, I hope. And so there are seasons when um, we just don't have time or something else is happening or we're caring for somebody or our job goes crazy or, you know, people have children or you never know. But um, I hope eventually we can come back to our making practice. I have the, you know, I have those things myself, so. Okay, I feel like I need to have a light right behind me. I know I'm creating shadows. Uh, in the other house, I had a light right next to me. Maybe I'll do that again. Just because my arm is in the way of the light. And it's probably hard to see anyway. I have considered a GoPro like strapped to my chest. I feel like it would move too much, that it would be like, it would make people nauseous. Um, but it might be easier to see. This gray feels like the weather here today. Um, I know you can't see out the window behind me um, isn't actually pointed at the mountains, but um, I cannot see them. They are uh, covered in fog or hopefully up there it's snowing. Oh, Sally, great question. Um, Sally asked why, now that it's even, why don't I just use one weft all the way across? And that has to do with weft tension. Um, it's a lot harder to get your weft tension even. If the farther across you try to weave one weft without breaking it with um, a relay, the harder it is to get your weft tension. Correct? And so... Um, at this point, it's just second nature for me. If, if a piece is more than about three inches wide, I'll always, and it's one color, I will still always have more than one weft and sometimes even in smaller pieces. Those little relays where, which is the point where those two, let's see where the last one was. Uh, right there. The point where those two met, that's a relay. Um, that creates a tiny hole. It leaves more space um, in there, which will keep the tapestry from drawing in, hopefully. It will help combat that tendency. And uh, yeah, it's also easier to bubble. One of the reasons um, for weaving this way versus bringing um, wefts long distances is that if you put in, you know, an inch or inch and a half at a time, it's easier to get the right amount of weft in. Weft tension. All about weft tension.
It's a great question. There are times where I will bring a butterfly all the way across. Um, it usually has to do with color. If I'm using hand spun and I have created a yarn that I want, that's a singles, that's a particular color pathway, then using two wefts like this would destroy the color option. And so in that case, I just have to be a lot more careful about the bubbling to make sure my weft tension is correct or within the ballpark. So there's what I'm talking about. I'm just putting it through when you're picking the shed. Um, you only go through an inch or a little bit more at a time. And that is, um, if I had the shedding mechanism on, it would be tempting to just throw that weft all the way across, which um, would be fine. Just takes more attention in terms of the weft tension. This seems to be a weft tension day. thinking about that, adding that other gray, and I am, actually I'm wondering if I actually want it to be up there. I'm also, the way I want to add the gray, Willie floats on the back, and I'm debating whether, how much I care about that. Um, I am going to do something different in this section up here, and I really would like the tapestry to lay flat, I will mount it, and I want it to be able to lay flat on the mount. And so if I have a lot of floats, if I'm mixing colors as I'm weaving um, with a sort of demi dui idea, uh, I'll have a lot of floats and it'll be thicker in that area. And I don't know if it will lay as flat as I want it to. So. Those kinds of considerations are part of learning to think like a tapestry weaver. That you're thinking ahead enough to be like, oh, if I do that, it's not going to be, I'm, I wanted to mount it this way. And if I weave it that way, it's not going to lay, it's not going to be, I won't be able to mount it the way I wanted to. Okay. Thanks, Vincent. I think Vincent's talking about, um, I did a podcast with um, Long Thread Media right after my book came out, The Art of Tapestry Weaving, uh, which came out three years ago. And I did a podcast with them. I think it was in January of 2021. Anyway, they just re-released it this past weekend, and it was really fun to listen to that again. I was happy they re-released it, and hopefully it's a fun, a fun listen, and um, it's super well edited, so it's not terribly long, and it's talk about everything from the book to occupational therapy. I am an occupational therapist. At least I think I can say that for another two weeks when my license will lapse. Um, and then I don't know if I can call, I guess I can call myself an OT. I'm just not registered anymore. Anyway, occupational therapy is a profession that started with weaving in World War I, using weaving, uh, among other craft forms. And so I talk about that a little bit in the podcast. Um, so yeah, just go to Long Thread Media and you'll find it. Or if you just go to your podcast app and Google my name, you'll find it. And I'm sorry, search. Wow. Google has become a, a term that just means search, hasn't it? Way to go, Google. Nice job uh, ruling the search world. Okay, 
So then I'm, now I'm back here, so, you know, it's the shed thing. Like, oh, okay, these need to come together. I don't have a shedding error. I just haven't finished my sequence. Now they're coming together. If you're um, a beginner and this is super confusing, the way I keep, you know, not quite finishing a sequence and weaving something else, um, just know you can weave the whole thing across. Make sure it's all finished, then do the next line. A line is called a pick. Okay. I think I've talked myself out of adding that gray until perhaps all the way up there. If you come on March 27, you will see what I'm going to do in the middle. I'm not going to give it away right now, but it does involve color. And I'm looking at these colors. Not all of them, just maybe three of them. So here, you know, I might, oh, I might do this. And then um, if you're not used to watching what's happening, you haven't yet learned to read your weaving, you might be confused. So instead, I could have brought this all the way over and this all the way over. And that's a good beginner hack to make sure that you are finishing your sequences. <laughs> Hi, Audrey. Yeah, I can't. I also can't believe it's been three years um, since the book. The book was released in November of 2020. It was actually released on Election Day of 2020. I remember that because, so it must have been like November 3 or something. Um, the It was supposed to be released in October and it got delayed by a couple of weeks. And I was so not happy when I found out it was election day in the United States. When, I mean, it, do, it totally doesn't matter at this point, but it could, you know, it's not necessarily the thing you want on an election day. People are paying attention to other things on election day. We'll just put it that way. Uh, at least you hope they are. We hope they are. Those of us who care about democracy hope that people are paying attention to other things on election day. All right, so. Oh, thanks, Marla. She says, I love to watch you splice. It gets easier with practice. Everything gets easier with practice. Thanks, Barbara. She was talking about the podcast and enjoying the bit about occupational therapy. So, I'll let you listen to the podcast, but I talk about how I came to both occupational therapy and weaving. And Ann Mara is a great um, interviewer, and they have excellent people editing. I don't know who their video editor is or their podcast editor is, but. They made me sound way better than I'm sure I sounded um, when we were recording it. So I'm grateful for the excellent work that Longthread did on that. I'll be linking that um, episode, I think, in my blog on Thursday. So I'll put more about it on there. I do write a blog, you guys. I still write a blog uh, almost every Thursday. I know it seems old fashioned to some people, but I think it's useful. And I try to have a fair number of educational blog posts every year. So now I'm all the way up here to the top of this curve. I'm going to go all the way to the edge. All right, cool. Okay, I'm excited to get up here, but we won't get there today. I apologize. Um, I had some hope, but it's too it's too far. I will weave up that far before um, our next change the shed, so you will be surprised. You won't have to watch me weave a bunch of plain weave, which is what we have now. 
Tapestry is plain weave. It's just a um, unbalanced plain weave. The warps are wider set so that the weft can slide down and cover them. <laughs> Apparently 2020 was the year of the panini. I do like a good panini, so. Um, if you're talking about the sandwich. Um. Oh, thanks, Emily. Emily said she's enjoying the Tapestry Discovery Box. So the current Tapestry Discovery Box, that's the project that I do with Gist Yarn. Uh, it's a collaboration, so it is a subscription, but you get um, a course every quarter from me and um, yarn from Gist. Anyway, Emily said she's so glad she tried it out. She's loving it. Right now, the current box is about eccentric weaving which is what I did here, but the box is actually about going farther and the weaving is a lot of fun. We've seen some really, I've seen some really super fun weavings come out of this box. So, I mean, every box I see that, but. Okay, I'm, cause I'm sitting sideways. Hold on, I'm just gonna lean back and look at this. Um, it looks pretty level. I'm going to put a little fill in here because I think my sitting sideways is um, sort of warping my perspective. So this is a little, those of you who are knitters, it's like doing a short row in knitting, I'm just filling in a lower spot, which you do all the time in tapestry. Oh, that's cool. Dave said um, about the podcast, um, his father was wounded during World War II and the sisters who ran the hospital where he was in India taught the injured soldiers to do embroidery. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's how OT started is that the wounded, this was World War I that OT started. Um, but there were, um, basically they were just aides. Um, they didn't really have training uh beyond just being a medical aid and they were called rehabilitation aids and um they did it was especially for mental health for you know the guys in world war one coming home i mean all soldiers coming home have seen horrible things but um, a lot of mental health stuff so ot really started as primarily a mental health profession using, um, like Dave is saying, embroidery. His dad, um, the sisters used embroidery. Um, same thing. It helps your hands, but it also really helps your mind. Weaving, embroidery, fiber crafts, knitting. I'm sure they did crocheting and um, whatever's accessible and can keep your hands and mind busy for a while. We all know that getting lost in a making something is um, really good for our mental health. <laughs> Some of you are talking about splicing and either making your tails too long or too short. Um, Julia says she makes hers too long and Jessica says she plays yarn chicken, makes them super short. Um, oh, hi, Kate. Glad you're here. A couple of you said it's been a while since you've been to a Live changed the shed, so happy you all made it. So I will weave the rest of this um, off camera. And next time, um, next time we will look at this piece uh, up. Well, you now can't see that. 
Hold on. Oh, I'm messing up my cameras. Hold on. Okay. We'll look at uh, this part up here. You can see the lines on the warp and where I want to put in some color. So I might change my mind. You don't know. Um, I might do the thing where I put it in and then decide, oh, I didn't like that. So um, yeah. Anyway, I'm glad that you all made it here. Thank you for hanging out and uh, asking questions and watching me weave. This piece has been a lot of fun. It's about topo lines and uh, that for me is all about walking, maps and walking. So I hope you're well. I hope you have a great next couple of weeks and I'll see you in an online class or maybe I will see you here um, for the next Change to the Shed on March 27. All right, y'all. Oh, don't forget if you want to sign up for Fixing Your Sheds, that um, workshop that I'm doing, which is you can register now and see some preliminary stuff. And then the content all opens on March 30th when I'm doing a live um, training. That is a Saturday. And then the Q&A a couple weeks later is on a weekday. And they'll all be recorded. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming, y'all. I appreciate all of you so much, and I'll see you in a couple weeks, if not before. Bye, y'all.